Faithful saints now be at peace, for your eyes have finally seen what was promised is fulfilled. Death can hear and lame are healed. We have seen this outstretched arm, saving us from every harm. Sing out in praise the joy.
the pastor here at uh, Bado Bay Baptist Church. It's not only been a strange week, it's been a strange morning for us as well. So COVID seems to be taking over uh, the northern beaches of, of Sydney. And I don't know, I'm going to blame COVID this morning for us not being able to live stream. For whatever reason, we're actually not streaming at the moment. So we're going to record church and upload church. So I can't actually welcome at this point in time all the people watching online because they won't be able to watch until we're finished church until we upload it today. So maybe pray that those result, that whatever issue is going on gets resolved, uh, but uh, we're trying to solve that problem at the morning. So it's been a strange kind of morning, hasn't it? In indeed, it's been a bit of a strange week, uh, because here we are as a state uh, and as a church, we're experiencing restrictions that are, that are easing off and becoming more relaxed. But by the end of the week, uh, the northern beaches of, of Sydney, uh, they're back in lockdown, and the anxiety of people has raised enormously again, hasn't it? And uh, we appreciate that there's probably going to be some people uncomfortable about uh, coming to church at the moment. And so we are conscious that more people than, than normal might be wanting to watch online. So we, we do pray that that resolves quickly and we're able to live stream our church. But I guess it's a good reminder, isn't it, that in the midst of everything that happens in life, we're not in control. Uh, in all that goes on, our best laid plans can come completely unstuck, can't they? And isn't it good to come to church to remind ourselves that, that we can look to a God who is in complete control, a God who is unchangeable, a God who says something that he's going to do and he does it. There's no accidents, there's no mistakes. God's plans never fail. At Christmas time, it's a reminder that God's plans never fail. God sent Jesus into this world. God's plan to save us was happening at Christmas time. And that's why it's such a wonderful thing. Let me read these verses to you from John chapter 3, verse 16. We read this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It was always God's plan. Always God's plan. For Jesus to come into this world to be our saviour. And that's a really good reason to praise God. Uh, we're going to praise God in song. Our first song this morning is Mary's boy child, Jesus Christ, was born on Christmas Day. Now at this stage, the COVID restrictions have eased and there's no rules to suggest that we can't sing at this point in time. Keep your social distance, one and a half metres. Nicholas, five metres from everyone else. So as far as we know, we're following all the rules and we can still sing this morning. So I invite you to stand that we might sing our first song this morning, Mary's Boy Child, Jesus Christ. Born on Christmas. 
such a blessing to all be here together close to Christmas. Um, kids, that is those who are still in school or yet to attend school, um, if you have hair on the greyer side and you haven't attended school ever, you're welcome to come up as well. But otherwise, all of, all of the smaller people in church, please come on up the front. So kids, come up and grab a seat in the front here. It's great to grab a seat over here. That's it. Perfect. Perfect. Now, I've got a couple of friends here who are going to help me explain to you a little bit of the story of what the adults are going to hear in church. Because today there's actually no kids' church. You, you guys are in church. So I want you to hear a little kids' version of what the adults are going to hear really soon. So I'm going to ask uh, Jonah Wally to come up and help me with this. You see, today we're looking at a section of the Bible called Isaiah. Can you say Isaiah? Have, have another go. Isaiah. Isaiah. Yeah, it's pretty tricky, isn't it? Isaiah. Well, you see, in Isaiah chapter 9... God said something. God said one day a baby prince is going to be born and this prince will bring peace. God had said through Isaiah that the wars were going to end, that the fighting was going to stop, that anger was going to be gone forever, all because of this prince, that he would be the prince of peace. He would bring peace to the whole world. It would be just like at the beginning. Do you remember the very, very beginning of the Bible? The very, very start of what happened? You see, in the beginning, God first made the world. And when God made the world, there was peace. Why, even a ferocious lion would be at peace with a playful lamb. You see, instead of tearing apart the lamb for his dinner, the lion would play with the lamb. The lion would even care for the lamb. The lion would even cuddle the lamb. You see, there was peace between the lion and the lamb. And not only did the animals live in peace, that all of creation lived in peace. You see, in the beginning, even people lived at peace. The first man, Adam... And the first woman, Eve, they lived in peace. They never pushed or shoved if they went to sit down. No, they always thought of the other person. They never fought or argued over a seat. Instead, they'd share. They never cursed or said rude things. They always listened to each other. They were at peace with each other. And the reason they're at peace with each other was because they're at peace with God. But one day, everything changed. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. Eve disobeyed God and ate the fruit that God had told her not to eat. And and Adam followed as well. They disobeyed God. Now, they waged war on God, and so they waged war on each other. And they felt great shame. For the first time ever, they fought and argued. For the first time ever, they cursed and they said rude things. There was no longer peace with each other, because they were at peace with God. The peace of God's perfect world, it was now gone in an instant. And you know what? All of creation even felt it as well. Even the animals, instead of the lion, now playing with the lamb and caring for the lamb and cutting the lamb, the lion was now hungry. And the lion was looking at the lamb as if his dinner, a roast lamb dinner, And of course the lamb was very worried and had to flee for its life. (laughs) You see, in Isaiah chapter 9, 
God had said a prince of peace would come who would reverse all of this. And in Isaiah, by the time of Isaiah chapter 11, God had promised that peace would come again. And this peace would come for everyone, every person, and everything, even all of creation. Peace for the whole world and God's prince of peace. He was the one who was going to bring this peace to fix things up, to make it all right again. Even the lion, the lamb, would be at peace with each other. People would be at peace with each other. And you know what's so important to remember at Christmas time? That Jesus is this Prince of Peace. He is this Prince that God had promised would come into the world. And you know, it happened not at Christmas time, but at Easter time when Jesus dies on a cross. That was how he made peace between all of us and God. And when Jesus comes back again, he's going to bring this new world where he will be the better leader and it will be a better world. It'll be a world full of peace, just like God started at the beginning of time. What a great thing to look forward to. And it happens because it can all come when we trust in Jesus, knowing that God has sent Jesus into this world for us. So why don't we thank God that at Christmas time, the Prince of Peace has come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you have had a plan and that plan was to bring the Prince of Peace into this world for us. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, that he is that Prince of Peace. Lord, please help us to look to Jesus, to trust in him, knowing that one day we can be part of your eternal, wonderful kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to do something a little bit different today. While you're here, we're going to sing a kid's song. Because we haven't done a kid's song. Often you're out in kids' church doing a kid's song. So we're going to do a song just for you in church, and it's a Christmas song. It's a Colin Buchanan song, and it's called Merry, Merry Christmas, Come and Find Forgiveness. So uh, we're going to do some actions. Nicola's going to sing, and uh, we're all going to stand, and we're going to sing Merry, Merry Christmas, Come and Find Forgiveness, Jesus Christ the King is Born. Okay, ready? So let's stand. Let's sing together. Now you guys can go back to your parents, but on your way, do you want to grab this worksheet here? It's just here for you. And please also grab the pencils and you can uh, take that to your sister or brother over uh, back at your seat as well. Because you guys are in church today, so it's great to have you here in church with us. And we want you to be able to do that, to focus on what we're learning about here in church today. Uh, a little bit of church news to share just before we come and pray together. Uh, a couple of birthdays to mention. Uh, one birthday is Bev Cross. So happy birthday. Bev, I'm going to give you a little tip. Bev's on the phone in the foyer. Happy birthday, Bev. It's all those birthday celebrations are already coming in for her already. They're all, so make sure you wish Bev happy birthday uh, today. So happy birthday, Bev. Also, Malcolm McKay has his birthday this week. 
Uh, we have Emmaus calendars for 2021 for sale from Ken Riddell. That supports prison ministry, so if you're still looking for a Christmas gift, $5 up the back for those, Christmas, uh, for those calendars. Also, today at 4 o'clock is our prayer meeting. We do pray on the, it's the first and third. This is the third Sunday of the month, isn't it? Uh, so the first and third we, we pray, and today at 4 o'clock is our prayer meeting from 4 to 5 p.m. And just to let you know that we will be live streaming church at 9 o'clock Christmas Day. Uh, 9 o'clock Christmas Day church is what we're doing here. Uh, so please come and start your Christmas celebration here with church. We will live stream that, assuming we can get it to work, of course. And then next Sunday, the 27th, we'll be back here as well for, uh, for church at 10 o'clock, our usual time. And the kids will be in church and we'll make church a little bit more friendly and, uh, and able to accommodate that. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time now praying. And, um, and Marion and Thomas are going to lead us in prayer. Thomas, as you come up the front, we might just move this lectern back in place, please, and then we'll be ready to pray. Let's pray. Yeah. Let's pray. Let's pray. Just hang on. Let's pray. Maybe testing, testing. Is it going to work? I'm probably my, it's my microphone that's working. Is this microphone working? Hello? No, not working? You know what? Nicola's microphone was working. Can we blame COVID for this as well? Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we praise and honour you this morning because you are the creator, provider and sustainer of all life. Here on the Central Coast, we praise you for the beauty of the world around us, the tall trees, the variety of birds and singing cicadas, colourful and sweet-smelling flowers, beautiful beaches, with powerful waves and the ocean vast and wide. These things in creation declare your power, your strength, your creativity and your glory. We praise you because you're good. This is a comfort because you're always in control and are watching over every aspect of our lives. You're sovereign, you care about us and all the small details of our lives. You know everything about us, all our thoughts and words and actions, for you are all-knowing, and yet you love us. We marvel at this and thank you for your unfailing love and mercy for all those who put their trust in Jesus. We are sorry that we have sinned in the way we have spoken to others, harshly, rudely, by complaining, by arguing, slandering, gossiping and lying. We are sorry that by our actions and in our thoughts we have failed to love others, to be patient and to put others before ourselves. We are sorry that we try to be self-sufficient rather than call on you in times of need or stress. Please forgive us for not putting into practice what we hear and read in your word. We are sorry that we think of ourselves better than we really are. As we read and hear your word, help us to see your holiness, your majesty and glory and prompt us by your Holy Spirit to grow more aware of our sin and how much we offend you. We give thanks and praise for sending Jesus to become human, to leave heavenly glory, to become like us, to take the punishment we deserve for our sin. We thank you for your forgiveness. We praise you, Lord God, for raising Jesus to life, for defeating Satan and giving us hope for all eternity. We thank you for friendship and family. We thank you for our church family, that you have gifted people in different ways to build up the body of believers and to reach out to others. We thank you for the Christian University students who came in this last week to help our church. Thank you that they are up to being encouragement. May you, our God, be glorified by the church family of Battle Bay. We pray for the Henderson family as they take your word to the people in Arnhem Land. May the spread of the gospel there not be affected by the COVID virus so that many people this Christmas can hear about you through their ministry. 
We commit those who are recovering from recent surgery into your loving care, especially Amber, Pam, Albert and Lorraine. Strengthen and heal their bodies. Increase their faith as each day they look to you. We pray also for those who are known to us who are suffering with struggles, pain or long-term illness. Especially we pray this week for Suzanne and Bill, Diana, Margaret, Marion, Kathy, Elizabeth and John, Joy, Ray and Ed. May their earthly circumstances help them to have an eternal perspective that causes each one of them to trust Jesus, such that their suffering seems light and momentary and their hope for eternal life with Jesus looms bright and strong. For those who are lonely and who cannot get out and about, we pray that they would know your presence with them. May you comfort them and look after them, especially over the Christmas period. Thank you for technology that can help at this time and for the opportunity to live stream church. Lord God, we pray that the COVID-19 virus will die out. In the meantime, we pray that the people would make wise choices in helping to stop the spread of the virus. Please help our government leaders, Scott Morrison and Gladys Berejiklian, to be able to find strategies to project, protect our country with minimal loss of livelihood and freedom. Please lead medical professionals to a solution to fight this virus. Strengthen and protect doctors and nurses caring for the sick and those being tested. Comfort those disappointed by recent developments with lockdowns and restrictions who will now no longer be able to see family at this holiday time. We pray for those living in hotspots or those who have visited hotspots, especially the elderly and those known to us to be safe and to not catch the virus. Finally, we give thanks for Christmas time when we remember the birth of Jesus, the incredible wonder of you, our God, taking on human flesh, becoming a baby and man so that we could know you, so that we could be in relationship with you, so that we could have our sins forgiven. As this day of celebrating comes, may our church be a beacon of light and hope for all those who seek you this Christmas. Please give each one of us opportunities to speak of the true reason for Christmas this week. May our faith increase as we dwell on all that it means for the one true and living God to humble himself and become a man, to become the saviour of the world. All these things we pray in the great name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. We're going to sing the next song now. It's the first Noel. Please stand and sing with us. The first Noel
a seat and Margaret is going to come and read the Bible for us. from the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 9 and verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of greatness there will be no, sorry, of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And from the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favoured. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favour with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Well, we are going to look at uh, this passage in Isaiah in a little bit more detail this morning. So if you do have a Bible handy, it might be worth keeping Isaiah chapter 9 or a phone if you want to look at Isaiah chapter 9. Only two verses today, really verses 6 and 7, that's what we're focusing on uh, as a church. Right up until um, until last week, we've been looking at Acts chapter, or all of the book of Acts, actually. Whereas today we thought, well, Christmas is coming really soon. It's a bit scary how close Christmas is. Who's not done any Christmas shopping yet at all? That's us. Marion, it's only you and I. We're the only ones who haven't done any Christmas shopping yet. Everyone else, you're all ready for Christmas, aren't you? No. Well, do you know what? In helping us prepare for Christmas, in helping us think about not just the shops, not just about COVID, thinking about everything else that uh, Christmas is clouding around in our minds, we're going to think about Jesus and how it was God's plan to send Jesus into this world and how he planned that hundreds of years beforehand. So why don't you join me in praying, then we'll look at God's word together. Heavenly Father, we again open your word at this special time of year when we remember the birth of your Saviour, Jesus. And we ask that you'd help us to understand fully who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Please help us to understand these words of Isaiah written so many, many years ago. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a couple of weeks ago here at church, we had our church annual meeting and we elected a new leadership team. Uh, Today I'm going to run another election, an election where everyone can vote, even the kids, 
Uh, it's no secret ballot this election, it's purely by show of hands. And the leader that we're going to elect today is going to represent us locally and also elect, uh, represent us right across the country. Now that can be a bit of a daunting task, it's a big responsibility. So I've actually narrowed the field down to three candidates for you today. I'm going to tell you the three candidates and then we're going to vote for who you'd want to elect. Now candidate A, or candidate A has already been kicked out of office twice. Candidate A is known to sleep until noon. When they were at college, this candidate was known to have used opium and drinks a glass of whiskey every evening. So lock that in your mind, there's candidate A. Candidate B, well, this candidate is divisive and has a very abrupt personality. Been married several times, been known or alleged to have a number of extramarital affairs. His family has cooked up a whole bunch of fraudulent pot plots and suspicious methods to avoid paying taxes seen as self-centred, prejudiced, not thought to be very truthful, actually often blames other people rather than taking responsibility for themselves. So there's candidate B. Lock that person in your mind if you want to vote for them. Candidate C. Well, this candidate is a decorated war hero, also an author, vegetarian. That's a reason not to vote for them, isn't it? No, no, no. <laughs> vegetarian, doesn't smoke, drinks an occasional beer and is not known to have had any extra marital affairs. So there we go, candidate A, B and C. Time to vote. Do it by show of hands. Who's your vote going to be for? So here we go. Uh, candidate A, kicked out of college twice. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah you don't, don't you applaud about being kicked out of college, Thomas. Uh, candidate B, no one. Candidate C, yeah, probably the majority. Now, let me tell you about the candidates that you've just voted for, okay? So candidate A, that many people rejected. No wonder you went for them, Ed. Do you know who it is, Ed? You know, don't you, your English heritage? Here we go. The picture's up here. Winston Churchill. You knew that, didn't you, Ed? You did. <laughs> Very good. Winston Churchill, the, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom who, uh, who led Britain through uh, Second World War and motivated Britain to never give up. Candidate B, who no one here voted for, but millions of Americans did, was <laughs> Donald Trump. And candidate C, who most of you voted for, was actually <laughs> Adolf Hitler. Now, of course, under Hitler's leadership, he, um, he had a very rac racially motivated kind of um, ideology in the Nazi regime. It's actually responsible for the genocide of six million Jews and millions of other victims who were deemed socially undesirable. Now, I came across some figures this week that Hitler and the Nazi regime were responsible for the killing of about 19 million civilians and prisoners of war. Now, I know that election was a little bit unfair, wasn't it? Perhaps a few of you uh, know me well enough to, to know that I was being a little bit selective in the information and you were, sus you were suspicious when you were voting. But I guess the point I want to make is that we're not very good at choosing our leaders, are we? Scott Morrison, as the Prime Minister of Australia, seems to be riding a surge of popularity at the moment. Yet only 12 months ago, this time of year, 12 months ago, he was criticised for taking a family holiday in the middle of a bunch of bushfires. It made national news. He, he uh, had firemen who wouldn't shake his hand uh, funny now you'd be criticised if you did shake their hand, wouldn't you, for, uh, in the middle of COVID at the moment. But, but I suspect that it's not going to be too much long, even the, despite the popularity Scott Morrison has at the moment, it won't be too much longer before we're disillusioned and grumbling about Scott Morrison, just as we have with every single Prime Minister we've had previously. And I guess the point is that we as people, we're used to being let down by our leaders. We're not surprised to hear stories of scandals. We're used to our leaders being a little bit deceptive and then putting a positive spin on things and how they present to the public. The fact is, we don't choose our leaders well. Not just at the political level, but also at a personal level. We're not always wise about the people that we choose to let influence us and to let, to let shape the decisions that we make in our lives. Uh, there's a book called The Road Less Travelled. Perhaps you've seen this book. It's been around for a very long time now. More than uh, 10 million copies sold by M. Scott Peck. It's been a hugely popular book. It, it, it's claimed to have impacted the lives of millions of people. It offers to change the lives of those who read it. Uh, Peck claimed to be a Christian. 
His spiritual insights were particularly popular with alcoholics anonymous, anonymous but uh, according to the obituary from his family and friends that have been published, this is what we know about him, who, who, uh, about Peck, who, who offers to guide our lives. Peck was a self-deluded, gin-sodden, chain-smoking neurotic whose life was characterised by incessant infidelity and an inability to relate to his children or parents. And that was written by his family. And this is the book, this is the man that millions of people in our world turn to for advice and guidance in life. Many of us turn to social media though, don't we? Or, or magazines. We have all sorts of different media that we let influence us. One study found that by spending three minutes, women who spend three minutes looking at pictures of models in magazines, 70% of those women will feel depressed and shameful after having looked at those magazines. The reality is, those that we choose to lead us, those that we let influence us, we choose very poorly. We're not wise about who we listen to. We're not wise about who influences our lives, be that on a national level, a political level, or be that on a personal level. We're badly governed. We're poorly led. And yet that Bible reading that Margaret read to us a few moments ago was written for people who were badly governed. The kings of Israel who were governing Israel at the time, they were listening to bad advice. They were weak, they were ungodly leaders, and they were leading the state of Israel into a state of national emergency. The government expected to be overrun at any moment by, by an aggressive and powerful neighbour, a superpower to take control of them. It's dark days, and, and Israel are hoping for a better leader. And Isaiah, who speaks these words, gives promise. Promise of, of better things, a better leader to come. In the midst of these dark days, Isaiah is giving a, a beacon of light about a perfect king. This is 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And Isaiah speaks of a better leader. Listen to what he says in the first part of chapter 9, verse 6. He for, says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. 700 years before Jesus came, Isaiah is prophesying about Jesus. He prophesies of this, of this better leader, of this perfect king who would be born for our sake. Isaiah is prophesying that the birth of Jesus will be no ordinary birth because this is not going to be any ordinary child. There's something unique about him. There's a story about a little boy who was doing a school project on his family tree. One day he came home and said, Dad, where do I come from? Dad was feeling a bit shy, a little bit awkward, and said, well, the stork bought you. A little bit later, the boy asked his mum, Mum, where do you come from? Mum was also feeling a little bit shy, a little bit awkward, so she said, well, the stork brought me. The boy wasn't sure what to make of all of this, so he went to his grandmother and said, Grandma, where do you come from? Grandma stuck with the same line. The stork bought me also. The next day, the little boy went to school. He started writing his project and he wrote this. There's nothing normal about my family. There's not been a normal birth in our family for three generations. <laughs> when it comes to the birth of Jesus, we find nothing normal. Think about it. 700 years prior to his birth, his coming was predicted. He was born to a virgin. His arrival in the world was announced by angels and a moving star. A manger, an animal food trough, that was his first bed. And on more than 60 specific occasions, God's prophet had made predictions about his life and about his death. You see, everything about the birth of Jesus is kind of unique and it grabs your attention. This is no ordinary child. But indeed, it's not, just the ordinary, it's not just the extraordinary birth of Jesus that is unique. Think about his life. There was nothing normal about the life of Jesus. What he said, what he did, it kind of grabs your attention. Things like this. Jesus had power over nature. He was able to calm a raging storm with his words. He had the power to perform miracles, to heal and to help. He even had the power to bring a dead girl back to life again. 
Then there was the amazing things that Jesus taught that defy our human understanding. Things like loving your enemies. The teachings that we don't like to follow. Teachings that we want to push to one side because they're so confronting. And the most amazing thing about Jesus is here is a man who dies on a cross, but then he comes back to life again. He even appears to his disciples, a whole bunch of followers, to prove that he really is alive. You see, we have every reason to believe that Jesus really is God's gift to us all here. Truly, to us, a son is given. A gift from God to me, to you, to the whole world. Christmas time is a time where we love receiving presents, isn't it? It's probably the, the highlight, particularly for children, at Christmas time. And the truth that we need to remember today is that this gift of God's own Son is so much better than anything else that we can receive. And it's better because the government will be on his shoulders. He will be a better leader, a much better leader than we could ever choose, and that makes him a great gift. It makes him a leader who's worth following. And the words of Isaiah go on to tell us more of why Jesus is worth following. Isaiah gives us some pretty impressive titles for Jesus. Now, I wonder if you've ever heard the official title for Prince Charles. Let me give you, here's the official title for Prince Charles, or some of them anyway. His Royal Highness, the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George, Prince of Wales, Duke of Cornwall, Duke of Rothesay, Earl of Carrick, Earl of Chester, Lord of the Isles, Prince and Great Steward of Scotland, Royal Knight Companion and Most Noble Order of the Garter, Ex Extra Knight of the Most Ancient and Most Noble Order of the Thistle, Grand Master and Principal Knight Grand Cross of the Most Honourable Order of Bath, Member of the Order of Merit, Companion of the Queen's Service Order, Heir Apparent to the Throne. That's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Sounds impressive, but as grand as those titles are, as amazing as it might be for Prince Charles, it's nothing compared to the titles that Jesus is given in what's written here in Isaiah. Have a look at the verse, rest of verse 6 with me. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Aren't they amazing titles? The first one there is that he will be Wonderful Counselor. You see, the counsel of Jesus is not just good, it's a wonder. There's something supernatural about it. Jesus came to teach us God, how to live God's way. He came to teach us how to be friends with God. The counsel of Jesus is unsurpassed. We don't need to rely on the media. We don't need to rely on self-help gurus or that well-meaning relative who can barely hold things together for themselves. We, need, we don't need those people for direction in life. We have Jesus. We have Jesus, the wonderful counsellor. But Isaiah also says that Jesus is mighty God. That is the miracle of Christmas time. God didn't just send another person to rule us. God himself came into this world. God took on human flesh when he entered this world to lead us. That very the very same God who created the sun, the sun that has a core temperature of 15 million degrees Celsius, this same God is the one who came into the world as a man to be our leader. And as, been, as well as being a wonderful counsellor and mighty God, Jesus is everlasting. Most heroes kind of come, then they go. Steve Waugh was my great cricket hero. I think he's one of the greatest players to ever play for Australia. But he retired more than 15 years ago. He's old news now. My kids wouldn't even know about him. That's it for heroes, isn't it? They're here today, gone tomorrow. But Jesus lasts forever. And Jesus is also called the Prince of Peace. We talked about that in the kids' spot, didn't we? That he is the kind of leader we need. And even though we don't like to acknowledge it, you and I and all of humanity, we're all at war with God. Each of us, we've set ourselves up in opposition to God in rebellion against him. We usurp it. We usurp his authority. We claim his authority for ourselves. We remove God from that rightful place, that rightful rule of our lives. We presume to decide for ourselves how we're going to live, what's right and wrong, what we will do and won't do. We decide it, don't we? We're not concerned about God's opinions. We're more concerned about our opinions. We remove God from the picture. 
Now, that's not a good thing to do to the ruler of this world. If you're going to pick a fight, don't declare it on the almighty God. It's really no contest, is it? We're used to thinking at Christmas time of Jesus as this baby in the manger. But by the end of the Bible, this baby in the manger is depicted as a warrior king leading a mighty army. We think of angels, those pretty little Christmas tree, the little decorations that we put on our Christmas trees. But in the Bible, the first angel has a flashing, flaming sword. It's no wonder when the angel appears to Mary, to the shepherds, the first thing they have to say is, don't be afraid. You see, because we're people, you and I, we rebel against God. We're going to face God's anger. Jesus called that hell. That's why we need the Prince of Peace. We need Jesus. We need the Prince of Peace to bring us peace with God. Jesus comes to bring reconciliation. And he paid the price for that peace when he died on the cross, executed, punished, on a cross in our place, to forgive our sins, to bring us back to God. What a great leader. We have this wonderful leader. Who would do that for you and me? It's what we're promised in this reading. A better leader. A leader for you, a leader for me. A better leader than any leader we've ever known. But not only does Isaiah speak of Jesus being a better leader, he speaks of him leading a better world. Look at verse 7 with me. It says, of, his incre- of the increase in his government and peace, there will be no end. You see, there's no sudden regime change. There's, there's no late night phone calls, no party meetings to change leaders because of poor opinion polling. No, Isaiah says his government will increase. And that's been happening for the last 2,000 years. Since the birth of Jesus, people have become his subjects, one by one, swearing allegiance to him. In fact, our gathering here this morning is evidence that more people are continuing to come under his rule. And verse 7 goes on to say that he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom. The talk of David's throne is is the language that the Bible writers use to to speak of God's kingdom. Uh, My passport says that I'm an Australian citizen, but when I choose to submit to Jesus as king, I become a citizen of another kingdom, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God goes on long after this life, long after this world is forgotten. And the characteristics of that kingdom, God's kingdom, are this, that God is establishing his kingdom. He's upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. You see, Isaiah says that Jesus will be establishing and upholding God's kingdom with justice and righteousness. And isn't that the kind of world that we long for? Shouldn't humanity live in that kind of world? See, over the centuries we've failed again and again to live in a way, to, to, to live in a way that brings peace. We've failed to, to have justice and righteousness in our world. In fact, the vast majority of people in our world still live in violent and turbulent places. Even here in Australia, the comfort of society, the comfort of Australia, we can't even claim to have found justice in our own country, can we? All too often, we, we read the newspaper, we see the news, we we hear of a verdict in a court case that goes to the person with the best lawyer, the person who can argue the the best, and people are intimidated these days. They're they're hurt by those around them. You see, all of these things, it's a sign that our world is not right. But Christmas time, Christmas time marks the beginning of a new world and a new order. The arrival of Jesus marks the start of a just kingdom, a righteous kingdom that is ruled by Jesus himself. You see, Jesus brings about a a new world order that will never end, where Jesus will rule his kingdom forever. When I was growing up, the uh, the rule, I'm ageing myself here a little bit, the rule of the Soviet Union, the rule of communism, it seemed invincible. I used to see pictures like this, the the May Day parades in Russia. It was always an intimidating show of power. The Berlin Wall, you might remember the Berlin Wall, it seemed a permanent and unshakable part of life. But now images of the Berlin Wall, well, they're history. The powers and authorities of those kingdoms are long consigned to history. You see, kingdoms come and kingdoms go. Nations rise nations fall. 
but the kingdom that Jesus has established will outlast them all. And Jesus is not waiting for your vote or mine. His government is going to go on increasing and one day every power, every authority will submit to him. You see, Jesus plans to remove President Biden, or Trump if he refuses to leave the White House. One day Jesus will remove Prime Minister Morrison. One day Jesus will overthrow the Republic of China, no matter what threats they make. In fact, Jesus will overthrow every government, every authority, every principality in this world, because one day Jesus will reign victoriously in his kingdom forever. And so the vital question we have today is simply this. Will we submit to Jesus and be part of his world? Or will we continue in our rebellion for our few years on earth to be overthrown in the end? You see, the Prince of Peace, he offers us all peace with God. Can I ask you this morning, have you been reconciled to God? There's only a few days left till Christmas. At Christmas time, we're going to remember that God has given us the very best gift of all. God has given us a new leader. He's given us a new world, and Jesus is that leader. Jesus is the king of a world where there is peace, where poverty will be done away with, where debt will be wiped out. Too many of us settle for just a box of chocolates, some candy canes as a Christmas present, when we can have a new leader a better leader, and be part of his new and better world. Can I urge you today, choose your leaders well. Choose Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me that we do? Let's pray. Lord God, today we've been reminded of what Christmas is really about and why it's really uh, a great celebration that Jesus came into this world to enable us to enter into his kingdom. Lord God, we want to say that we're sorry that we've ignored you. We're sorry for the times that we think that we know how to run our lives better than you do. We're sorry for when we've pushed Jesus to one side in our lives. Lord God, please forgive us. And Father God, we commit ourselves today to following Jesus as our leader. We long to be part of his world, and so we ask that you'd help us to follow him all of our days. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our final song this morning. The song is Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. I enjoy you, invite you to stand or sing together.
thanks for being with us here today. We trust you've been reminded to uh, look to Jesus at Christmas time, that he is a better leader for a better world. We, uh, we do pray that uh, the online service is working for Christmas Day. Uh, I know we've only recorded church today and we'll put it up online now, but uh, barring any change of COVID rules, we'll be here at 9am on Christmas Day and back here again next Sunday at 10 o'clock for our usual time. Both of those services are going to be live streamed. Uh, earlier today... Uh, Margaret read some verses from Luke chapter 1. Let me finish with these words. This is what the angel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1. You will be with child and give birth to a son. You will give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Wonderful truths. Let's remember those truths. It's Christmas time. We'll see you soon. Should be